Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for the latest installment of the TLV Corporation webinar series. I'm joined by my co-presenter, Alec Newell. My name is Andrew Moore, and uh, we're gonna be going through Steam Traps 101 today. So basically uh, covering different types of Steam Trap technologies along with sizing and selection considerations. And uh, just before we dive into things, uh, we'll go through this disclaimer quickly about the contents of this webinar. So we'll give you a few seconds to read through that. Okay, so I'll now turn it over to Alec Newell who will get things kicked off. Awesome, thanks Trent. So one of the key components to system optimization are your steam traps. With proper sizing, selection, and installation, steam traps can greatly enhance product quality as well as plant reliability. So key, a couple key goals to system or steam system optimization are to supply dry steam to your steam users, as well as from that equipment and tracing, drain that condensate quickly and efficiently. And if possible, return that condensate to help with overall system efficiency. There are three main functions of a steam trap. First, to discharge condensate from the steam system. After discharging condensate from the steam system, that trap needs to be able to shut off tightly in order to prevent steam loss. And last, discharge any incondensable gases. So there might be leftover air from your startup situation. The first trap type I'd like to cover is the thermostatic steam trap. The operating principle for these traps are temperature. So we're gonna cover balance pressure capsules, which is gonna operate on temperature as well as pressure. And then the bimetallic trap, it's gonna operate solely on temperature. So let's take a look at TLV's, one of TLV's balance pressure traps. The main component here is our X element capsule. I'll cover what that is. So we have a valve head attached to two lower diaphragms and then two upper diaphragms that encase a thermal liquid. This thermal liquid is a mixture of alcohol and water. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the saturation curve of water. So as you increase pressure, you also increase the boiling temperature of the water. Well, by having a alcohol water mixture, we can actually have a, a boiling point curve that's a certain degree lower than that water. And so the goal here is to maintain a boiling point less than water at any given pressure. This animation will take a look at what that looks like during operation. So during startup, your system's gonna be full of air and cold condensate. And that air and cold condensate, as it begins to enter the steam trap, it won't have the thermal energy to vaporize that thermal liquid. So at this point, the trap is gonna remain open and it's gonna vent out any air and cold condensate. As the system starts to heat up, we get closer to our steam, which is gonna vaporize that thermal liquid, shutting the trap. And this condensate that's surrounding the X element will need to subcool for that trap to reopen. And that's how this trap will begin to cycle. So some advantages to this trap type, it's very good at venting air. Um, during startup conditions or if there's air in your system during operation. It's very compact body and relative to its size, it's got a high capacity. Because this trap operates on temperature, it's not sensitive to any installation orientation. And TLV's X element is actually suitable for a small degree of superheat. Some considerations to think about when installing the steam trap is understand how it's gonna operate. It's gonna back up a little bit of condensate before it reopens, and so there's kind of a cyclical discharge to this trap. As well as balanced pressures, pre pressure traps in general are not suitable for a high degree of superheat. Next, I'm gonna go over the bimetallic trap. So this is a bimetal strip. It's made up of two different metals, one being a high thermal expansion and the other having a low thermal expansion. So on this left side, you'll see a cold, unflexed element. As that heats up, that high thermal expansion side is gonna actually curl over, causing this element to bend. So there's a few different valve types that I'd like to cover, one being a upstream valve head, 
So this, the valve head is gonna seat on the upstream side of the seating surface. And on the other side, you have your downstream valve head. So this valve head is gonna seat on the downstream seating surface of the seat. So how does this look on the pressure temperature curve? Well, since this is based on temperature, we're gonna have a fixed closing temperature with this upstream valve head design. And the goal here is to set this temperature lower than our steam temperature at our given steam pressure. There's a few more things to consider with a downstream valve head, as the downstream valve head is gonna have to work against the upstream pressure. So that's actually gonna give us a varying closing temperature. So as you increase that inlet pressure, that's gonna cause the bimetals to have to pull back even harder against that valve head in order for the trap to close. Again, the idea here is still, still to set that closing point lower than our steam temperature. Since those bimetals are having to undergo a lot of strength just to pull back on that against the upstream pressure, those bimetals can start to become fatigued and they start losing some of their strength. And so that requires a higher temperature under the same pressure. So what this can cause is you get a closing temperature that's equal or even higher than your steam temperature that will result, result in a leaking steam trap. Last thing to consider with this downstream valve head design is back pressure is gonna help those bimetals close this trap. And so as you increase back pressure, it's actually gonna be pushing up against that valve head, closing that trap quicker than what it normally would, ultimately resulting in a, um, a further degree of subcooling in your condensate. Now going back to the upstream valve head design, this is TLV's Lex, Lex steam trap. So you can see there's air and cold condensate entering this trap right now. And those bimetals remain unflexed. This trap is wide open, discharging condensate. And as steam or hot condensate surround those bimetals, you'll see those bimetals flex. Now that animation is sped up just to show how this trap cycles, but that's pretty much how this trap will operate. Some advantages to this trap type, you're setting that set, you're, you're able to adjust that set temperature to better match your application. You can use this as a pre-freeze drainage. So you set that temperature very low and that'll open up to relieve any condensate in your, left, in your equipment before it freezes. In addition, this can be installed in any orientation since it's really operating off of the temperature change. There's a built-in auger device for cleaning, and I'll cover that in this next slide. Some considerations to think about when installing the steam trap. Know that it is gonna back up condensate, just like that balance pressure element. And also, you wanna make sure you're setting that temperature uh, to match your application. So let's look at the augering device. So this is kind of a built-in cleaning feature that TLV has incorporated with this steam trap model. And so you can screw that adjustment screw all the way down, kind of freeing any dirt and debris that may have settled on the seating surface. This is very common in copper tracing, if you're familiar with that. The next trap I'd like to cover is mechanical steam traps. The operating princ principle for mechanical steam traps is buoyancy. So we're gonna cover an inverted bucket trap, a lever trap, as well as TLV's free float. So here's an animation of an inverted bucket trap. You can see the buoyancy element is that bucket since it's upside down. So this bucket's not gonna have buoyancy until we build up a water prime and there's either steam or air inside of that bucket, which is get, then gonna lift the bucket, closing off your valve seat. And you can see those linkages with your valve head and valve seat on the top side of that trap. Now, when there's air in that bucket, there's actually a tiny weep hole that slowly bleeds that air, and that's how that trap gets rid of the air in the system, just kind of during startup. So as we get closer to our steam interface, you'll begin to get steam introducing to this trap, filling up that bucket, giving that bucket buoyancy again, which then closes off the trap. And this trap will continue to cycle as that steam is either bled through the weep hole or condenses with the water prime that's in the bucket already. So some advantages to this model, 
depending on your material and connection size, this can be a relatively inexpensive steam trap. It's suitable for high back pressures. So mechanical steam traps in general can handle a high back pressure as long as you maintain some sort of pressure differential. And based on its operation, uh, this is suitable to be installed on a steam locking application. Some, con some considerations to think about with this trap is its air venting capability. So there's really just that, there's no added element for air venting, it's just that tiny weep hole, and that will bleed air as well as steam. Without having a water prime, this bucket has no way to float. And so if you lose that water prime for some reason, this trap will remain wide open. One of those situations that you may lose your water prime is during superheat. So this trap is not suitable for superheat as that superheat could vaporize your water prime inside of the steam trap. It is a cyclical discharge. So that's just something you have to consider when using this trap. And due to the linkages, single valve head and single valve seat, it's kind of susceptible to localized wear, which will eventually lead to leakages as well as uh, trap failure. The next steam trap I want to cover is a lever float. So this lever float actually has a thermostatic element inside of it. And so during startup, cold condensate and air, that thermostatic element is going to be wide open and it's going to discharge air. As condensate begins to enter the trap, that float's going to become buoyant, opening the lever mechanism, allowing condensate to pass through the main valve seat. And as our system heats up, our XL, or sorry, not our X element, the thermostatic element is going to close due to high temperatures. And then once we discharge all that condensate, that float and lever mechanism will then shut. Some advantages to the steam trap is it's more of a continuous discharge. So because this is a float floating on uh, the liquid level, it will change based on what's coming in. As I mentioned, there is a thermostatic element, so this is very good at venting air. Because of its lever mechanism, it actually allows you to have or incorporate a larger orifice size, which then results in high capacities. Some considerations for the steam trap. You still have similar uh, linkages, a single seating surface being a single valve head and a single valve seat, which could eventually wear out giving you leaks. And there's no added measure of protection against water hammer. And so if you get into a water hammer event, it could damage your lever mechanism or even damage your seating surfaces. This trap is going to be sensitive to how it's installed based because of the float and lever mechanism. The, ne the next trap I'm going to cover is TLV's free float. So you'll notice there's a float in the bottom as well as the X element that I discussed earlier. So we discussed how the X element operates. It's going to be wide open during air and cold condensate. So this will help out with the startup of the, your system. As steam enters, the X element's going to close. And now our main operating function is that float and orifice at the lower side of the trap. As condensate begins to enter the trap, the float becomes buoyant and just kind of modulates around that orifice, allowing condensate to discharge downstream. So let's take a look at what that looks like with an actual video. So because this float has to become buoyant, there always is under normal operation, a liquid level. And the benefit to this is that orifice never really sees live steam. And so there's really um, no way for live steam to leak through this orifice during normal operation. Some of the advantages to this trap type is there's a single moving part. The only moving part in this trap is that free float and it's continuously rotating to give you a brand new seating surface. Continuous discharge. Um, and it's going to self-modulate based on how much condensate is coming in. You saw in the animation when there was a lot of condensate coming in, that float fully lifted off the orifice. As well as the X element is very receptive to any air that enters into the steam trap. It's going to open up and, and allow that air to vent. And during startup, that X element is going to be wide open as well. Some of our free float models do include a three-point seating. And so this is for your superheat conditions or your low load 
conditions um, where you may not have that water prime, this three point seating will ensure a very tight shutoff with that float and the orifice. Additional advantage, we've taken great care to make sure that this trap is has a high shock resistance to prevent any or to help mitigate any damage from water hammer. Some considerations to think about when installing this trap, because there's the float, it needs to seat against the orifice properly. It is sensitive to installation orientation. The last trap type I'm gonna discuss is the thermodynamic or a disc trap. So thermodynamic, it operates based on Bernoulli's principle. So there's a relationship between velocity and pressure. As velocity increases, pressure is going to decrease as well. So you can see here with a high velocity going underneath that sheet of paper, it's going to create a low pressure pulling that sheet of paper down. Another situation, if you had a high velocity going between two balloons, it's going to pull those balloons together because of that low pressure. Now, how does that work in a dish trap? Well, as steam is pushing condensate through this trap, condensate won't really have that high of a velocity. And then as soon as steam reaches the bottom side of that disc, that steam is going to wick across the bottom side of the disc, creating a localized low pressure, pulling the disc down into the seating surface. Once that disc is shut, there's actually a small pocket of steam that gets trapped on the top side of the disc. Now with radiant heat loss, that pocket of steam will slowly condense, losing the closing force because that closing force is pushing down on the disc and our inlet pressure and our back pressure are pushing up on the disc. Once that force dissipates, the disc will then open again. We'll take a look at what that looks like inside of the steam trap. So TLV has incorporated a thermostatic element to help with startup conditions or when there's air in the system. So this thermostatic element is gonna hold that disc off of the seating surface, preventing it from fully closing. And so this is gonna help with air and cold condensate during startup. And once our system heats up and we start getting steam to this trap, that steam again is going to create a localized low pressure under that, underneath that disc, pulling that disc closed. Then when our radiant heat or we get radiant heat loss, vaporizing or condensing that um, pocket of steam on the top side of the disc, the disc will then uh, cycle again. Some advantages for the steam trap. This is very simple construction. Each model has a capability of operating underneath a wide pressure range. It's very compact design, and this trap can be installed in any orientation. Being installed horizontally will give a longer life to this trap. Because all this, uh, this trap is made of solid pieces, it's very, um, or it, can handle up, it can handle very high pressures as well. Certain models can. Some considerations to think about with this trap is it is a cyclical discharge that trap needs to open and close. And so every time it's closed, you're gonna get a small amount of backup. So you just need to consider that when installing this trap. Because your upstream pressures and downstream pressures are pushing up against your disc, you need to be considerate of your, down, your back pressure because it is limited to between 50 and 80% of your inlet pressure. Most other models, other than TLV disc traps, uh, don't have an added air vent capability. There's no added thermostatic element. And with this trap operating on uh, radiant heat loss from that uh, on the top side of the disc, this is gonna be susceptible to uh, any wind or rain. It's gonna cause this trap to cycle more frequently. Let's take a closer look at what the thermostatic element looks like. So there's a bimetal ring that hugs the seating surface. And so when it's cold, it's contracted, holding that disc or preventing that disc from fully shutting. Why is that important? Well, this disc trap doesn't really know a difference between air and steam. And so air can create that same localized low pressure causing that disc to shut. So you can see on the left, that disc is shut. And on the right side with the added air vent, the disc never really fully seated and that air could pass freely. If air is trapped on the top side of the disc without the um, thermostatic ring, uh, the only way for that air to uh, 
discharge is by leaking through that steam trap. So that's what I'm gonna cover for the trap operating principles. If you're interested in reading more, Tracy Snow, another one of our engineers, uh, wrote a fantastic article and that's available as one of the downloads to this webinar. From there, I'm gonna pass it back to Drew. All right, thank you, Alec. Let me grab control. All right, so now that we've gone through different steam trap technologies, we'll take a look at different considerations whenever we're selecting uh, and sizing a steam trap. So if we look at our typical steam trap installation, uh, there's a few things we need to consider. The first is what is the application we're draining and what is our condensate load? Next, we're going to look at our operating and design pressures and temperatures, are commonly known as PMO, PMA, TMO, and TMA. We'll also need to look at our size, connection, and material of our steam trap. The last thing we'll need to consider is what is our back pressure or our condensate recovery line pressure. Now, when it comes to application requirements, our applications are gonna have very different requirements. So things like steam distribution are going to have different requirements from let's say process heaters or from tracers. Um, so because the, app, the requirements are so different, there's not a one type fits all steam trap for these applications. So there's a lot of important considerations like is my steam superheated or saturated? Do I need continuous drainage or can I tolerate a cyclic discharge steam trap? Can I tolerate condensate backup and subcooling or do I need to have immediate condensate drainage from that steam trap? And these are just a few of them along with air venting. So if we look at condensate load, now condensate loads are usually either specified on a data sheet or we can measure or calculate these loads. There's actually three different condensate loads that we need to take into consideration. The first being our startup load, which is typically the maximum load that we're going to see on an application. That can be significantly higher than what we would typically see during normal operation of that steam trap because we have a large mass of pipe uh, and equipment that needs to be heated on startup. So that's going to require a significant uh, amount of condensate to condense to get that up to temperature. Next is our normal load, what we would expect to see during steady state or normal operation. And with some steam traps, we might also need to consider what is our minimum condensate load. Some steam traps may require a minimum flow rate in order to operate properly. So these things can all uh, affect what our steam trap sizing will look like. Another important factor for, for condensate load is our sizing factor. Now our sizing factor is basically going to be a buffer uh, between what our actual conditions are uh, versus maybe some changes that we may see due to differential pressure or maybe a maximum startup load. So typically we'll take our, our calculated or specified condensate load, multiply that by a sizing factor to establish our sizing load. And this is going to vary based on the type of steam trap we have. So typical sizing factors we see for something like a TLD free float would be a 1.5 time sizing factor. So for a, a steam application with a thousand pound condensate load, we'd want to size that trap for at least 1500 pounds an hour. And for other steam trap types, we're typically going to see about a two to three time sizing factor applied. But now an important note here is that this is going to vary greatly based on the manufacturer as well as your site specifications. So we'd encourage you to look at your site specifications to determine if you have a specific sizing factor that you're required to meet, or uh, if your manufacturer recommends something much larger. Now looking at operating versus design conditions. Now our operating conditions, we have our minimum, normal, and maximum operating conditions. This is referring to our temperature and pressure. And this is the conditions at which our steam trap needs to operate normally at within that range. So if we look at pressure, for instance, we may be operating at a normal pressure, but that application may have a range of a minimum and a maximum that that trap must meet. Now, if we look at our design or our allowable conditions, those are conditions that the trap needs to be able to physically withstand without damage but that trap may not be able to operate under those conditions. 
So that's really just a safety type condition that you need to meet. And that is going to usually be slightly or significantly higher than your normal or maximum operating conditions. Now, the second important piece when sizing a steam trap beyond our condensate load is our differential pressure. So if we look at a steam trap example, a trap discharging from 145 PSI into a return header running at about 29 PSI, our normal differential pressure is going to be our inlet pressure minus our outlet pressure, or in this instance, about 116 PSI differential. But that is not our maximum pressure differential. If we were to take that same application and discharge it to atmosphere, now our maximum pressure differential is actually 145 PSI. So we want to make sure that we're selecting a trap that will both discharge at our maximum pressure differential and yet still have enough capacity at what our normal or our minimum pressure differential may be. Now there's some special considerations we need to take into account with pressure differential, specifically with mechanical steam traps. So mechanical steam traps, unlike thermostatic or thermodynamic, um, are very sensitive to differential pressure. And we can install a very large orifice in our mechanical steam trap, which will give us a very high capacity. However, there's a trade-off and we'll have a very low operating pressure with that large orifice. Now, if we use a small orifice in our mechanical trap, it'll give us a lower capacity, but it'll allow us to use that same trap up to a higher operating pressure. So we can see that there's a trade-off between orifice size and maximum pressure uh, per operation. Now, it's important to note that if we exceed that maximum pressure of that orifice, our trap will not function and will actually lock it shut. So if we need more capacity, we're going to need to go to a larger trap uh, rather than just going up to a larger orifice if we exceed the orifice pressure. Now we'll take a look at different types of connections for steam traps. And this is pretty common throughout all types of valves and fittings. The first is going to be a threaded connection. So this is generally seen on low pressure applications uh, and it's easy to install and fairly easy for replacement. But the downside to that is it also is a potential leak joint um, versus something like a welded trap, such as a socket weld or butt weld trap, uh, which is typically used on medium to higher pressures, but it is more difficult to install because it doesn't involve welding. Uh, and it also is more difficult and takes longer to replace because it requires cutting and rewelding a steam trap in that line. Another common type of connection is your flanged connection. These you generally see on larger steam traps and at higher pressures. Uh, but replacement of this often requires either an exact face-to-face -face or piping modifications, which can be a bit difficult. Another common steam trap connection type is what we call the quick trap connector. Uh, this is a two-piece steam trap consisting of an inline connector and a steam trap module. Now with this, it has a two bolt module, which makes it easy for maintenance and replacement. Um, and it can be the connector can be installed in any piping configuration. And since it is a bolt on module, there are different steam trap technologies that can be bolted onto the same connector. So here's examples of TLV's free float, along with a thermos thermodynamic as well as thermostatic trap modules that can be attached to that same connector. And another nice thing it is, is that it is fairly universal across most steam trap manufacturers. So many different manufacturers, connectors will fit many different manufacturers steam trap modules. Now we can take a look at steam trap material. And a very common material that we see is cast iron. In cast iron, this is generally seen for low to medium pressures and temperatures, generally below about 450 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is very common in uh, light industry as well as institutional type uh, settings, such as universities or district uh, steam distribution systems. Another is carbon steel, uh, which is generally seen in higher pressures and temperatures, typically up to about 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and it's good for, higher, for its higher strength and its corrosion resistance over cast iron. 
uh, and you see this very often in heavy industry, uh, such as the oil and petrochemical industry. And then the, the third type of materials we see are stainless steel and alloy steels. And these generally have the highest pressure and temperature capabilities, uh, sometimes up to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit or more, uh, and it has very high corrosion resistance. And we see this very often in the power generation industry uh, because it is suitable for very high pressures and temperatures. And then we also see stainless in a lot of food and pharmaceutical applications because of its high corrosion resistance. Now, it's important to also look at life cycle cost of a steam trap whenever we're taking all of these things into consideration. So if we look at a few different, uh, different items for two different steam trap models, we have model A, which may have a higher initial purchasing price, uh, but it is a more energy efficient and a typically longer lasting steam trap versus model B, which has a lower purchasing price, but it's not as energy efficient or as long lasting. So it's important that we look at the entire life cycle of that steam trap and what it looks like for failure and replacement because a longer lasting, higher efficiency steam trap may cost us significantly less in the long run versus a lower price point steam trap. And if you want to know more about uh, steam trap and the costs associated with steam trap failures, Jim Risco wrote a great article back in February 2011, uh, published in Chemical Engineering Progress magazine. And this is attached to this webinar and you can also find it on our website. So now we'll switch gears a little bit and get into steam using applications and look at typical uh, equipment and applications uh, for these steam traps. And what do we need to really consider when selecting steam traps for these applications? So we'll start off by talking about steam mains and steam distribution type applications. We'll look at steam tracing, as well as some process equipment and the different considerations we need to account for when selecting a steam trap. So first we'll start off with steam mains and our drip pocket locations. So this is a typical drip pocket with a condensate discharge location. And we're generally going to want to see a drip pocket on a steam main about every 100 to 150 feet in order to drain out any condensate that is going to form due to radiant heat loss of our steam distribution piping. And here we're going to want to have a full size pocket uh, to allow condensate and dirt to fall out of that steam system to be drained so we're not carrying it downstream, degrading the quality of our steam. And it's also ideal to locate those valves in that steam trap down low, preferably near grade or somewhere where we have easy access so we can maintain that trap. We definitely don't want it to ha have it up in the pipe rack where that steam trap is inaccessible and unmaintainable. So here's an, a, an example of a condensate drip pocket sizing. We want to make sure that we're that we have the appropriate diameter as well as depth of that pocket to allow that condensate and dirt to fall out of our system. Uh, because if we make that pocket too small, that condensate can basically pass right over it and we can carry that condensate down our system, which can lead to erosion and potentially even a water hammer. Now our condensate discharge location, uh, you can see here there's many different components. Uh, and this is what we would consider an ideal condensate discharge location. But the condensate discharge locations at your site may look a little bit different depending on what your site specifications are. So you may see all or maybe only a portion of these components. So first is going to be an upstream blowdown valve followed by an inlet isolation valve. Next we have a Y strainer which is helping protect that steam trap from dirt and debris and preventing that steam trap from being blocked uh, which can cause condensate backup. Of course we have our steam trap uh, as well as a bypass valve. Now for critical applications we might have a bypass to make sure that we have uh, that we always have condensate drainage uh, in, in the event that our steam trap becomes blocked or the steam trap requires maintenance. So you may or may not see that bypass valve. We have an outlet check valve if we're returning to a condensate return header that has a back pressure as well as an outlet isolation valve and a blow and a downstream blowdown or test valve which is going to allow us to see that condensate discharge to atmosphere for steam trap troubleshooting. 
Now, the steam trap requirements for a CDL on a steam main, these are generally going to be very light loads, and we'll get into load calculations here in a moment. But we're going to want something that has little to no condensate backup, as well as something that's going to have continuous discharge uh, at or near saturation temperature. And because on startup our system is full of air, we're going to want to have a steam trap that is able to discharge that air out of the system quickly. So for steam trap selections, the best selections are going to be a mechanical style trap, such as the TLV free float, or a thermodynamic trap, like our Powerdyne. Alternatively, you could use a balanced pressure thermostatic trap, but we would definitely want to avoid using a bimetallic trap because of its tendency to back up large volumes of condensate. So now we can look at steam main startup loads. Now these startup loads are going to be significantly higher than our normal operating loads because we need to heat up the entire mass of pipe in our steam distribution system. So we could look up this equation and find all of these variables, uh, looking up the specific heat of our pipe material, the weight per linear foot, and many other things. Similarly, with our normal loads, we can look at many of the same variables, or we can do something much easier. So TLV has published a condensate load calculator on our website for both startup situations as well as normal running load situations for your steam mates. So if we go through an example of this, Looking at a typical steam main, we'll say 100 PSI steam header and 100 feet of 6 inch pipe uh, with typical insulation and a very low ambient condition. If we consider a one hour startup time, our startup load for this type of application is only going to be about 101 pounds an hour. So not a whole lot of condensate. Most half inch or three quarter inch steam traps are going to be able to handle that amount of load. And if we look at our normal load, it's even lower at only about 17 pounds an hour. Now, if we have a very large diameter header of 24 or 36 inches and we have several hundred feet of pipe, our steam loads, or our condensate loads could be significantly higher. So we wanna make sure that we take that in consideration uh, because this will be very dependent on your length and your diameter of your pipe. Now getting into some other types of distribution uh, applications. The first being our boiler header. This is typically the first condensate discharge location downstream of our boiler. And the goal here is to supply dry steam from our boiler, and we could potentially see high loads due to boiler carryover. Uh, so this is going to be a much larger trap than our typical steam main drip trap. So our trapping considerations here, we're generally gonna to wanna to size this trap for about five to 10% of our boiler capacity, which is going to result in a large trap. And we may even want redundant or multiple steam traps on this application to provide sufficient drainage. And we're going to want something that is going to continually drain with minimal backup. So our best selection here is going to be a large mechanical trap such as a free float. Control valve and pressure reduction stations are another important drain point in our condensate discharge location system. So the application goals here are we want to drain condensate before and after the valve. And that is to really protect that valve trim from erosion caused by condensate. And we also want to prevent condensate from pooling when that control valve or pressure reduction valve is closed and a rapid opening of that valve with backed up condensate could lead to a water hammer incident. So we want to avoid that. So our steam trapping considerations here are going to be very similar to our steam main and we're, that we're going to want something with continual drainage. Uh, so our best selections here are going to be a mechanical free float style trap or a thermodynamics trap. And again, we're definitely going to want to avoid that bimetal. Risers and expansion loops, we often see changes in elevation in steam systems, um, either going over roads or around objects or it just accounting for the thermal expansion of pipe. So the application goals here are we want to avoid condensate from pooling, which can lead to water hammer. Of course, condensate does not want to go uphill 
So it'll, it will not naturally go up these risers. We need to drain it before and even after that riser. And one thing we need to consider is bi-directional flow. So in larger steam systems, we may have multiple steam generation points. So we could see flow in both directions along this pipeline, depending on operation. So we need to make sure that we have traps upstream and downstream of these expansion loops. And again, our trapping considerations are the same for a typical drip trap on a steam main. Another location is going to be the end of our steam headers, our end of mains. And here we're typically going to see a higher startup load, as well as a high need for air venting, especially on startup, because everything is being pushed to the end of our system. So for this, we're typically going to want to have a higher capacity than a normal drip trap, along with something that has good air venting or even adds supplemental air venting. So our best selections for this will be a slightly higher capacity free float trap or thermodynamic trap. And again, this is not the type of application we would want a bimetallic steam trap on. So next is steam traps on superheated steam mains. Now you may ask yourself, well, do I really need steam traps on my superheated steam main? The answer here is yes, you still need steam traps on superheated applications. And the reason is you will still see a, a pretty heavy startup load uh, on initial system startup because that pipe is cold. So you need to be able to handle that, that condensate on startup. Now during normal operation, you may see almost zero load, but there are conditions where you may see uh, condensate due to upset conditions where you lose superheat or there's a sudden surge of condensate or something changes in your system. So you need to be able to adjust to those conditions. So our trapping considerations here are that you need a trap that is going to provide a tight seal even under a no load condition as well as something that's going to be responsive to any type of upset. So here your best selection is going to be something like a three-point seated free float or one of our high pressure thermodynamic power dyne disc traps. Another location is a steam separator in our header. Now the goal of a steam separator is to remove and train condensate from your steam main and to supply dry steam throughout your plant. So our goals here are that we need to remove a potentially high amount of condensate and typically we size that for at least five to 10% of the overall steam flow rate through that pipe. And we're going to want something with continual drainage. So typically we're gonna see a large free float style trap on a separator. Now often we see a large separator in a line trying to be drained by a half inch small disc trap, which often doesn't have nearly enough capacity in order to drain the amount of entrained moisture. So it's important to really consider steam trap sizing with that separator. So switching gears a little bit, getting into steam tracing. So steam tracing, for those who may not be familiar, we typically have a small diameter steam or copper tube uh, that is attached to our steam system that is connected to the outside of a product pipe. And the goal of this steam tracer is basically to provide just a slight amount of heat to that product pipe in order to maintain product viscosity. So these are often used for winterization or freeze protection um, just to keep product pipe warm. And our condensate loads are typically fairly minimal, usually well less than 50 pounds an hour, probably down into the 10 to 20 pound an hour range. So our trapping considerations for a low temperature steam tracer one is it's going to be very light load. So we don't need a very large steam trap. We're going to want something that is very compact and easy to install because these are often just hanging on unsupported tubing rather than hard pipes. And often we see these in all different orientations. So we want something that is not sensitive to its installation orientation. We want to be able to select our desired amount of subcooling because in some cases with steam tracing, we actually want to use that subcooling uh, to heat that product. And I won't be talking much about steam locking today, but we will be talking about that two weeks during our Steam Traps 102 webinar. 
but we often see steam locking applications with steam tracing. So we want to make sure that if that is the case, we need to mitigate that. So our best selections for these types of applications are going to be small thermostatic or thermodynamic traps, or even a bimetallic trap, depending on what our requirements are for heating that product. Now we also have high temperature steam tracing. So the goal here is that we have a high need for thermal maintenance of that product. This may be a very viscous product that we're trying to keep warm to make sure that everything flows properly. So we want to make sure that we're getting as much heat into that product as possible with these tracing lines. So we want a steam trap with no backup. So our considerations here, we want something with little to no subcooling. And again, we're going to have very small loads, usually less than 50 pounds an hour per tracing line. So the best selection here would be a free float or a thermodynamic type trap. Another type, of another type of tracing is what we would consider instrumentation tracing. So the goal here is to prevent that instrumentation from freezing. So this is either a flow meter or analyzer or any other type of instrumentation uh, that in cold climate may not operate properly if it gets too cool. So we have a very low temperature requirement, but if we have high heat provided to that instrumentation, we may damage it, so we want to be very careful not to provide too much heat to this application. So our trapping considerations here, generally they're low pressure, very light loads, and we're going to want something that is very compact and easy to install. And here we're going to want to take advantage of a temperature adjustable trap to actually intentionally back up condensate and use the sensible heat of that condensate to do the heating rather than the latent heat of steam. So this is a perfect application for something similar to our Lex series temperature adjustable bimetal trap. All right, moving on from tracing into our process type applications, our HVAC heaters and our air coils. Um, so often these are referred to as unit heaters, comfort heaters, many different names. Uh, but basically they're doing some type of heating for personal comfort. Uh, and the big goal here is that we want to prevent freeze damage of these coils. So if we back up condensate in this type of coil, we have very cold air in cold climates going across these coils, it could freeze that condensate backed up in those coils and cause damage. So trapping considerations, we want something that has no condensate backup to prevent that freezing of those coils. And the load on these are typically going to be a light to medium load, maybe a few hundred pounds an hour, uh, but definitely more than our typical drip or tracer application. We're going to want something with good air venting, as well as something that's tolerant of dirt. Now, one thing with these types of applications is they're often seasonally used, meaning that they're turned off once it's springtime and they're never turned on again until the beginning of heating season in fall. So that gives the system plenty of time to build, build up dirt and scale and rust, which will then be flushed into the steam traps on startup. So we wanna make sure that we can handle that. Best selection for this type of application is going to be a mechanical style trap, such as a free float. So calculating condensate loads for air heating applications, we've actually made that very easy and we've included a calculator on our TLV website. So you can enter in your application information for your air heating conditions and calculate your condensate load for that application. All right, now we'll move into process heaters, which uh, can be very broad. There's many different types of process heaters, but we'll take a look at a common shell and tube type heat exchanger, where we're taking cold product in the bottom in green, we're heating it, with steam on the other side of that heat exchanger and we're raising it up to a desired set temperature. So the application goals here are to heat a product up to a desired temperature. And we're going to want to vent air quickly out of this heat exchanger on startup, especially if this is a batch operation type heat exchanger. If we can vent air quicker, we can have a, a, a shorter batch time. And one very important consideration and goal here is to avoid condensate backup, because as we back up condensate, we could be decreasing production 
as well as causing corrosion and even leading to water hammer within that heat exchanger. Now, sizing a trap for a process heater, we can look at our heat transfer equation, MCP multiplied by our delta T. Or we could look at our heat exchanger data sheet, and that should give us the information we need for how much condensate is going to be produced out of this heat exchanger given our operating conditions. But it's more, it's more complicated than that. There are many things that we cannot forget when sizing and selecting a steam trap for a process heater. So we need to consider things like, is my steam pressure changing uh, with my product conditions? And is my process temperature fluctuating at all? Or do I have seasonal changes in this heat exchanger running different loads in the winter versus different loads in the summer? Also need to consider if my condensate return, my condensate return line pressure changes or if I temporarily discharge my condensate to grade. So all of these things are going to greatly affect how we size and select a steam trap. And most importantly, we cannot avoid uh, considering the, st a, the heat exchanger going to what we call a stall condition. Now you might ask yourself, what is stall? I'm not going to go into detail on stall today, but we've attached an article written by Jim Risco back in 2004 detailing what stall is, why it happens, and how that affects a heat exchanger, and how that affects our selection of a drainage device for that heat exchanger. You can also watch a recording of our refining and petrochemical applications problem webinar on our website. Now, even though this is a refining and petrochemical webinar, the problems are often seen throughout all of industry. So it's not, stall is not a unique application problem for refining, but it's really universal. So you can learn a lot about stall in that webinar. Now, when selecting a trap for a process heater, what are the conditions that we need to take into account? One, we want to have a trap that is going to adjust to changes in our condensate load as well as our steam pressure. We need something that has good air venting as well as something that's not going to back up condensate. So our best selection here is going to be uh, a mechanical trap such as a TLB free float or if it's a large application, a process flow trap. And if it is a stall application, then we need to look at something more than just a steam trap, but we need to look at something like a combination pump trap, such as TLB's power trap. Now with all that to consider, we don't want to have you burdened with sizing and selecting steam traps or process applications and getting that wrong. So we want to be able to help you do that. So TLV has what we call a condensate drainage application form. We can send you this form. You provide us with the operating conditions of your process heating equipment. And we will provide you a recommendation with important notes about that application of how that steam trap or power trap should be installed and things that you need to consider when draining that equipment. And this is something that we do as a service to you to make sure that you get that piece of equipment right and op operating optimally. We've covered a lot of different applications and a lot of different considerations. So another thing that TLB provides is what we call a standard and trap application review. So here we will work with you to provide the best model selection for your steam system based on your individual site specifications. And you, ha you may have many unique STEAM applications, some that we never talked about, um, but we can look at those and come up with best, best practice solutions for that as well, as well as taking into account your preferred trap technologies. From that, we develop and we provide you with best practice installation diagrams based on your site's piping requirements and practices for all of these different types of applications. This is basically to take the guesswork out of steam trap selection and sizing and make it simple and easy for you to, to install those steam traps and optimize your steam system. So we thank you for joining us today. Um, our TLV consulting and engineering services are available. And in North America, if you ever have a question about a steam application, please feel free to reach out to us at 1-800-TLV-TRAP or email us at ces at tlvengineering.com. 
And if you're not in North America, we do have 14 global offices. So please feel free to reach out to a local TLV office close to you, and they can provide that consulting and engineering services as well. And as always, please feel free to visit our TLV.com website, where you can find the online calculator that I have shown here today, as well as many technical articles uh, beyond the three that we have shown today, as well as watching this webinar recording and all other webinar recordings. So with that, we thank you for, for joining us today and hope that you enjoyed our Steam Traps 101. Please feel free to join us in two weeks for Steam Traps 102, where we will be talking about Steam Trap installation problems and frequent, frequent problems that you see with failed Steam Traps. So we thank you again and hope to join us in two weeks.